wow, I can't see anyone. Flash on the screen. Even better, makes me a little less nervous. Um, so I'm going to speak about two things that really make me happy in the morning, make me passionate at night working and so on. Um, first is data, and second is really this notion of the moon, of exploration. You know, it's kind of where my, my ideas begin and my questioning begin, and I, I'm just fixated on this notion of how the heck did we get to the moon? You know, it's a huge effort, right? As, um, as we remember, it was very geopolitical, right? So you had the United States fighting Russia, but technology came out of it, right? And things like this, right? This amazing cockpit of a spaceflight explorer. You can just look at the cockpit and see the vestiges of the science in there, right? The algorithms that keep this thing in space. Um, even things like GPS that help us fly things like this modern 747 cockpit, see here. And um, it speaks a lot to my personal experience. Um, my father worked for, for Royal Amarok while I was growing up. Grew up in between New York, Paris, back and forth to Morocco pretty much all the time when you have free tickets, right? It's the best thing you can do. Um, but really, you know, it was the notion that I was always flying, always seeing the world from above, and, you know, I really didn't connect with this image of the world. I kept on thinking of, of what was above. I, I connect more so with this image of the world, right? All of these satellites orbiting the world, this is what's actually going on. And so, you know, what this speaks to is just the immense amount of data that we collect about our movements. Um, we collect it, you know, from phones and so on. But basically what happened in this big data revolution is very stupid. Us engineers talk big data this and big data that. You know, basically there's just too much data, right? And we don't know what to do with it. And we had to figure out, first of all, where it came from, how to collect it and so on and so forth. So you see that, you know, in the world is about 7 billion people, 6.8 billion cell phones. It's just insane, right? So this data is coming from your phone, it's coming from the satellites, it's coming from credit card transactions that you're making, it's coming from emails. Uh, and we had to develop technology to store all of this stuff, to process all of this stuff in parallel, right? Have multiple computers crunch things at the same time. And it gave us immense analytics and insight. So really what it gave us is a model of the world in action. And the granularity of this model is just unsurpassed um, in the last couple of years, and that's that's kind of what I've been doing um, in my professional life. Um, it's what people at, you know, this girl from Google is doing at this data center. Um, maybe she's researching, like, her next trip to Morocco, booking a ticket or something. Um, no, but more seriously, it's what this guy is doing at Debrelef, setting up phones. In a matter of 15 minutes, he's going to set you up with Skype, and then you can conference with China, and that data is being recorded somewhere. It's what I'm doing on my couch, day in, day out, just kind of hacking around, collecting data. But I wanted to take a step today to show you kind of what we could do in Morocco, just pull some files out of this drawer, and really kind of concentrate on this cartographic experience, right? This is one of the oldest maps of Casablanca. Actually, you can see it's just called Anfa back then. And, you know, it looks like a piece of art for us, but you can imagine back then this actually gave someone a feel of what the city looked like, right? Because map maps are data. Um, and so what our problem in Casablanca is this traffic, right? There's just enormous traffic, um, jams, and, you know, ambulances can't pass. And we have this tramway system that we've built, but, sorry, we have this tramway system that we've built, and I thought, you know, maybe I could take a look at the tram and this problem of traffic through Instagram. Right, namely, as, uh, as they introduced, is just this mobile application. You take your phone, you snap a picture, there's GPS coordinates attached, and Instagram are, are kind enough to give you uh, API access to some of this data. So let's take a look at, at, at what we can do with this data when we map it onto to real world problems. So, right here, I just kind of mapped the basic tramway stations. I'm missing a couple, I got a little lazy, but it, it explains the, the kind of flow of of the actual, the line. And what I did was I laid it all over with each and every picture that I've been collecting of Instagram users over the last couple of months. It's a couple, a couple hundred thousand actually. So what's cool is you can zoom in and you can actually like 
see each and every one of these pictures, you can actually you know, learn where people are moving, where the activity is. Um, you can see what pictures they take and so on and so forth. But it's cooler when you actually lay over a heat map and you start to draw contours around these pictures and start to understand the flows of your city, right? So your city is a breathing organism and these people taking pictures for fun are just kind of, you know, giving you this intense data of how your city works, right? And what we see here is that we've actually missed the most important center of activity from a tramway perspective, right? So if you actually take a look at the data and you see the ranges in between which people are, are moving from, from one zone to another, you see that here from Maddy, like they completely just missed the zone. Um, it's actually not walking distance. I tried to do it the other day. I figured out with a couple of, of techniques that these five extra stations probably were the m biggest priority in terms of uh, blockage in, in the city. Um, you know, you can even see that CD movement has a fair amount of activity and the train is good there. It's a little station here that's a bit off that I wish was corrected. But this is the sort of thing that we can do in a couple of hours for free using the Instagram API, right? This is not a 60, 70 million dollar study done by some foreign consultant. This is, you know, a tool that's out there in the open, open source and so on and so forth. So I'm just going to um, switch to, oops, can I switch? There we go. So the number there is about 65% of our activity that we're missing. And um, it's a shame, and, and there's a lot we can do about it. But what's cool is that, that we have the data and we can understand how our city works. You know, there's another uh, area of data which I find really interesting, namely government data, right? That's, that's mostly what I deal in uh, day in, day out. And um, I really like it when, you know, we can take a look at government budgets. You know, one thing to commend of the Moroccan government is that they're extremely transparent with their budget, right? So here, I've kind of mapped out each and every ministry's budget. Um, in a tool that comes, data comes directly from the government of Morocco, kind of broken down two groups, right? So you can see the new ministers that just of this new government are in red, the old ones are in blue. Um, so on the right here, actually, this is the totals of the budget, right? You can see the highest budgets there and the lowest budget here. It's a bit of a complicated map, so parallel coordinates, but bear with me for a second. These two metrics actually represent investment, right? So this is how much did the ministry get in new money for new projects, whereas these two metrics here represent how much fixed costs is this ministry maintaining year after year that are accumulating. And you see we have the data for every ministry, justice, uh, defense, uh, culture, jeunesse et sport, etc. Now what's cool about these sort of visualizations and the th sort of things that we can do with data is immediately see these kind of anomalies, right? So I'm looking here on the right, I see that these two different ministries end up having the same budget, but their curves look really weird and kind of almost polar opposites. So I just selected them, and it's actually Ministry of Transport in blue and Ministry of Health in red. And, you know, it, it was kind of a, a unique, you know, just way of looking at it. You can see that the Ministry of Health is actually has these huge fixed costs, right? Um, they're just rising from 2012 to 2013, which is Ministry of Transport does not have many fixed costs. They're extremely low. They're like, alors de l'échelle de 10 fois or something lower, right? So, whereas their investment, the Ministry of Transport, is super high, maybe six times higher than the Ministry of, of Health. And what you start to tease out in this is actually government strategy, right? Because people like to talk about we, who's the new minister this, and the new minister that, and so on and so forth. But we actually have the means and the transparency, thanks to the government, to see how they're deploying this money, to look at the strategy. And, and I think that's a far more powerful and, and interesting thing to be concerned about. Um, so, you know, data in, from the government can really help us. And let me just try to switch slides here. Sorry about that. And I don't want you guys to get lost in this, in this sea of data, but, but before I end, I just really want to kind of stress that we need to start to, to think about the decisions we're making, right? We're a country that's developing extremely quickly, right? So if you see this picture of Casablanca about, you know, a little less than 20 years ago, and you see it 
from, you know, today, you see that our city has almost doubled in size. Um, and so when it comes to urban planning, when it comes to l'aménagement du territoire in general, we need to be very conscious about how we're doing it. We can't just, you know, stick a ticket somewhere or so on and so forth. So I thought about contrasting this with a tool that I really like in data, and I'm going to tell you about it a little bit later, but for now, I just want you to look at orange production in Morocco. So this is in 1996. We had one of the best years in terms of orange export ever, 428 million kilograms exported. And you can see in green, actually, this is a satellite photo that was treated uh, with some infrared technology and a couple algorithms to tease out vegetation. In 2009, this is northern Morocco, um, you can see that we only sent out 188 million kilograms of oranges and not much green there, right? Not really, re not a lot of vegetation going on. Now, the, the cool thing about these pictures and the, one of the biggest powers of data is that it's predictive, right? And these pictures were actually taken in December, very much so like eight to seven months in advance of the actual year's production. And that's one of the most fascinating things about data is that you have the means to tell into the future. You have the means to kind of plan ahead. And data, because of this, is really a new currency, right? So data is a means of getting more sales. Data is a means of optimizing your supply chain. Data is a means of you know, making government decisions better. But for this, we need transparency. And we need modern society to be built on truth. Thank you.